I have a guest that I reached out to because I want everyone to meet Teddy Daniels. He is, he's a decorated cop. He's a decorated military veteran. He's a dad. And he's a guy who decided to get involved locally in politics because he didn't, like many of us, he didn't like some of the things that he was seeing happening. He's also a businessman who came up with a really interesting concept. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just want everybody to meet Teddy Daniels. Teddy, welcome to the program. Sergeant, thank you so much. And it's, on, it's an honor to actually talk to you. I've, I've seen you on the news and, you know, being, being a cop for years, I knew who you were. And I was like, wow, Sergeant Smith is reaching out. So this is really cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you're running for Congress in the 8th con Congressional District in Pennsylvania. But uh, before you decide to get into politics, um, you had quite a career in law enforcement, military, and in business. Talk just a minute about those things. Oh, okay. First off, I, I, I was a cop for 15 years. Um, I, I played football at West Virginia University. I, I got injured playing ball. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that an office job was not something that, uh, that would really suit me well. So I, I became a police officer, and I loved it. As Sergeant, let me, let me tell you, my, my first two years on the job, I learned more than I could have ever learned sitting in a classroom. People skills, uh, communication skills, de-escalation, you name it. So I spent 15 years, um, worked a lot of narcotics, um, was a court-recognized expert in use of force policy and procedure, and was a was the Department of Defensive Tactics and use of force instructor. So I loved it. You know, I hit that I hit that 15 year mark and I found myself sitting behind a desk. And I thought, you know what, there's there's got to be more out there. So you know I was I was banged up from playing ball and um, you know 15 years of on the job. People think it's an easy job and you know it's not. So I went and enlisted active duty in the U.S. Army. I went infantry. Uh, funny thing is, when I, I initially walked into a Marine Corps recruiting station, and uh, the Marine Corps recruiter said, uh, how old are you? And I said, I'm 35. He goes, yeah, our cutoff's 27. Try next door. So I walk into the Army recruiter, and the two sergeants in there stand up, and they say, hey, how you doing, sir? Uh, whose father are you? And... Uh, so no guys, I'm I'm here to enlist. So I went and took the uh, took the ASVAB, and you know the scores came back. They said Teddy, you can do any job you want to do in the military. You name it: military intelligence, bomb technician. The sky's the limit. And I said uh, I want to go infantry. And they looked at me like I was a little crazy, and they said, "You do realize what infantry is, and at your age, this is not going to be easy." And I said, well, if I'm walking away from one of the most rewarding careers I've ever had, it needs to mean something to me. So I went, I did that, uh, was stationed in Fort Carson, Colorado. And due to my law enforcement background, uh, they put me on something called COIST, uh, Company Intelligence Support Team. So when we were downrange in Afghanistan, you know, my primary MOS was infantrymen, but they cross-trained me. And I would go out on every patrol. I would talk to the Afghan villagers, the Afghan National Police, the Afghan National Army, find the intel and gather that intel where the Taliban was moving, where the terrorist networks were moving around. You know, we, we had high value targets that we were trying to get. And I would bring that information back to our commander so he would formulate a battle plan. Um, I was in Kunar province. It was the most kinetic area of the country. And 80% um, of the ordinance in the war was dropped in Kunar province where, where we were. Uh, was wounded in a firefight, took a couple bullets, uh, Purple Heart recipient. And I knew when I, when I came back to Fort Carson, Colorado, where I was stationed out of, I was in the medical retirement process. So I'm sitting back. I'm, I'm in the hospital in between surgeries and I got the, the news on the TV and, you know, they had all these marijuana dispensaries that were opening up and, 
you know, they were getting robbed. People were crashing trucks through their warehouses and stealing quarter million dollars worth of plants. The owners of these places were getting robbed at gunpoint um, because banks wouldn't do business with the industry. And a lot of the big security firms wouldn't touch it because they, they would have lost their federal contracts. So I actually started the first company in the space using former law enforcement and former military, highly trained guys to protect these, uh, these marijuana related businesses. And we would, we would transport the money for them and we would, we would vault the money. So in eight months, I took that company public, we sold and, uh, came back to Pennsylvania and, uh, actually started the second company in Pennsylvania. And that was acquired about two years ago. You are truly able to use your experience in police work and your experience in the military, and then go way outside the box to come up with uh, different businesses that, that address protection needs. Um, in an, and, you know, this is the thing, you know, you, whatever you feel about marijuana, it was when it became legal in Colorado, there were security issues that needed to be addressed. And you saw yes. that need. You know, so when when uh, when you're elected to Congress, what are some of your thoughts on, you know, rectifying that uh, states' rights issue with the legalization of cannabis and the kind of the federal refusal to really get involved in that industry. Well, I think, I think obviously it is a 10th amendment. Um, you know, it is a state's rights issue. The one thing that is killing the banking. So the company that I started in Pennsylvania, we actually had the capabilities and we worked with the businesses, with the financial institutions. And we, we had a vault where we would actually process this money and be able to transport this money legally to the Federal Reserve. Okay. So, you know, you know we, we worked with FinCEN, worked with a lot of agencies to make sure that everything was tightened up, that we could do it. Now, our insurance premiums were through the freaking roof, but we were able to get it done. And like I said, we, we were acquired uh, about two years ago. Now, on the federal level, again, when it comes to the actual marijuana, we handled the cash, okay? We handled the cash end of it. Um, on a personal level, do I feel that it should be uh, rescheduled from a lower classification where it is right now federally a Schedule One? Yeah, I kind of do. I really do. And, and, and I'll tell you why. My father, my father died of cancer a little over two years ago. The man was a hard right um, he was a brick and stone mason. He he looked and acted exactly like Paul Sr. from American Chopper. That that was my father. And I remember when I went off to college, you know, he said to me, he goes, hey, you smoke dope, I'll kill you. And he meant it, okay? He meant it. My dad was a no playing around kind of guy. And when he was suffering with cancer, the chemo was really, really, really killing him. And any type of pain medication, morphine, stuff like that, that he would take would just make him really sick. So he went and explored the, the whole medicinal marijuana. And I went to visit him one day and he's sitting on his back porch, smoking a joint. And I just looked at him. I said, dad, what happened to that speech when I, you know, you know, I go off to school, I'll kill you. He goes, tell you, you know what? I was wrong about a lot of things in my life. And uh, he goes, I don't think people should be driving, doing this or, or whatever. He goes, I'm sitting on my porch. It really, really, really helps with the pain. And that opened my eyes. And I was already out of the industry by then. And that really opened my eyes to, to the medicinal benefits of it. Uh, as far as federal... Um, you know, adult use or uh, recreational. I still think we need to see some more info on that. But I, I'm, I'm all for the medicinal end, where if you have a true uh, condition to where this can help, go for it. 
Um, on a personal level, I don't use it. Okay. Now I've known a lot of vets who have struggled with, with PTSD, with pain from injuries. And they say that it really helps them relax. It helps them sleep at night. Sergeant, I'm the type of guy though. I don't like feeling like I have lost control of my senses. So I, I carry a gun 24 seven. So I don't use it. You know, I don't want to feel like I'm impaired in any way, you know, shape or form. So it's a personal reason for me, which is why I don't use it. But the libertarian in me says, let people use it. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, that's what's uh, so perfect. Um, that's what's so perfect about... Um, a lot of your stances that I've read about and things is you're a guy who really believes in personal choice, you know, when it, it has comes to, be. To, to, you know, and, and that's the same with firearms and, and your kids' education and, mm -hmm. and all those things. And of course, one of the biggest issues we have in politics now is uh, um, police reform and the big talk about police reform. <sighs> Um, and so, uh, you know, I know that's got to be a big issue for you. And, uh, and so let's talk about that because again, you decided to get involved and you and I were talking, you know, off the air that, that, you know, all politics are local. So you decided, you they know are. what, I'm going to get involved. And so when you get to Congress, what's police reform going to look like for you? Police reform for me is going to look like big, bigger budgets for police departments, uh, bigger training budgets for police departments. Uh, right now, the government has really hamstringed police agencies. You look what they just did in Minnesota, okay, in, in, in Minneapolis. New York City getting rid of their qualified immunity. Now, Sergeant, you know as well as I do, proactive police work is what keeps a community safe reactive the crime's already been committed you're just showing up to take a report when you take away qualified immunity okay cops are not going to be proactive anymore it's not going to happen okay what they need to do is take qualified immunity away from politicians and give it back to the cops okay and the funny thing is 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 and all these people that are crying defund the defund the police they spend two hundred thousand dollars a year on their own personal security what about the people they represent? Do those people spend 200K a year on, on personal security? No. You know, so it's, I'm the king. I have mine. You know, you peasants fend for yourselves. That's, that's the message they're sending. And you're absolutely correct. And that's why, in fact, with the National Police Association, we got involved in Minneapolis and helped um, with some of the core proceedings to mm -hmm. make sure that citizens had police protection because, you know, and, and again, their city council, you know, we're seeing now they, they want to completely disband the police department, make it a public safety organization, which is just going to be a different word for a police department. It's kind of a bait and switch. And, and we're is. seeing that, you know, around the country where, you know, uh, Austin, Texas, it was one of the uh, cities that really truly defunded a good share of their police department and now those citizens are paying for it, as are the citizens of Chicago and Baltimore and, and New York and all that. You know, what what do you think can be done federally when you get to Washington, D.C. to help those citizens in urban areas as well as rural areas who have these radical city councils that want to get rid of their police departments? Well, and again, you know, it, it, it's a local government states rights issue. What we can do from the federal government is support them in any way that they can support the agencies, support the departments. You know, the, the problem um, where a lot of departments get into trouble, they don't have a lot of money in their training budget. You know, you need to train officers. You know, Sergeant, you're a police instructor. I was a police instructor. OK, I was fortunate enough that, that my agency sent me to the best schools in the country. Not just to learn it, but to teach it and come back and teach the other officers in your department. I would also go around and teach the officers in, in neighboring agencies. Um, 
Some departments have the budget, some don't. And we need to make sure that the that these training budgets in these agencies are not touched. You know, there's even been cases of mayors going into the police budget and pulling that money out to go pay for something else. That's a big issue too. So, you know, as far as a federal police force, okay, not for it at all. I don't agree with uh, the Capitol Police trying to branch out in Florida. The U.S. Capitol is not in Florida. Stay out of Florida, okay? It's wrong. It's oversight. It's overreach, okay? And it needs to stop. I think the best police departments out there are your, you know, your, your local community agencies, your city departments to where officers grew up there. They know the people. They know the communities. And they come from those communities. And that's what you need. Very well said. Well, Teddy, why do you think that there is such a push, you know, and, and we can go back to May of 2020, but there's been this push for well over a year to vilify law enforcement, especially uh, local, state, and county law enforcement. Why do you think that is? Oh, boy. Democrats operate under chaos. They thrive on chaos. And every day, our brothers and sisters go out there, and they hold that line, okay? Sorry, I don't know why anybody today would want to raise their hand and take that oath to do this job. God bless all of them, because, you know, I, I got out over 10 years ago. I couldn't do this job today. There is no way. It's, it's because it's the thin blue line. That is the line between chaos and order, okay? The Democrats thrive on chaos, so they don't want the police around. That's why. And they call our thin blue line flag, you know, racist and, and you know, and, and they, they say that our system is racist, you know, we've been- Anything that they cannot, there. anything that they cannot beat an argument with with facts is racist. Right, it's right. that simple. And in yeah. fact, we're at a point now where, uh, because the, the whole defund the police narrative was a big fail uh, for the political left, you know, because people are, um, mm -hmm. in fact, um, there's been many surveys done, uh, many polls done where people say, I don't want less cops. Uh, we need more cops more. in our neighborhood. Yeah. And that's turned out to kind of be a big, uh, a big fail for them. Who does uh, defunding really hurts. It hurts the people. It hurts the communities. And, and honestly, Sergeant, and you know this just as I do, it hurts the poor communities because they're not going to pull cops out of the rich neighborhoods. They're going to pull them out of the poor neighborhoods. That's who it's going to hurt. And it's a shame. You know, I worked some, some, uh, you know, some very bad neighborhoods. And half of the people there hated us, but the other half loved us. You know, the, the ones who lived there before their neighborhoods went to hell, okay? They were like, clean this block up. And we're like, hey, we got you, you know? So it, 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 hurts, it hurts the poor communities. Nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. More than a right? good cop. You're absolutely so right. I want you to talk about that because I, I know a lot of people say to law enforcement and retired law enforcement like you and I, you know, will you just defend anybody? And that's just not no. true, is it? No, because it's a stain on the entire profession. You know, I, I had I had a case in my career where I actually stood up against a, a police administrator who um, had a questionable background and, and was saying some pretty outwardly racist things. And, you know, it, you, you got to be the good guy and stand up. You know, that, that's what integrity is. That's what character is. Um, you know, and, and, and I feel that, you know, the scales of justice are blind. And if somebody, or if you go out there on a hard partisan end, whether it be right or left, and you're still wearing a batch, Okay. I think it makes people wonder, well, am I going to get a fair shake with this guy or this girl? Because I have a different political opinion. 
So I, I truly, and that's why a lot of civil service agencies are, you know, you're not allowed to involve yourself in, in politics. It's against the civil service regulations. So, you know, I, I, I spoke up about the, the Capitol police that testified on January 6th and, um, I felt their little performance was wrong, was dead wrong. Bernie Carrick, uh, you know, former New York City police commissioner, it, uh, echoed the same sentiment. So, uh, again, you know, now you know where, where these officers stand politically. If you're on the other side of the aisle, do you ever feel like you'd get a fair shake with one of these guys? You know, I mean, you heard their testimony. It was, it was absurd. So... That's why, again, a lot of agencies with uh, civil service, you know, where you have to go through, take the civil service exam, you are forbidden from being involved in anything politically. Absolutely. Teddy, I so wish we had more time. I'm going to have to bring you back as your candidacy continues. I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> where can people find you, find more about you, and where can they follow your social media? Uh, sorry, thank you. Go to teddydanielspa.com. That's Teddy like the bear, Daniels like the bourbon, and PA the state. Teddydanielspa.com. And on Twitter, you can find me at Daniels Congress. Daddy, you're going to be a big damn deal in this country. And I sure appreciate you spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Sam, put the gun down! Put the gun down! Last year, Law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.